Hello Colossal Con, my name is Ian D. Croyer. I am the also known as the Hero of Julios on my YouTube channel, and this is One Piece for Noobs. Uh, basically the goal of this panel is to catch anyone who is not familiar with One Piece up with basic terminology and stuff. I will be covering stuff within the first 100 chapters, which may seem a lot at first, but considering the manga is almost at its 900th or 800th chapter, there will be, you know, it's not really that huge of a difference. So the first thing I will be talking about is why should I be the person explaining all this? Well, I have been reading and watching One Piece for about six years now. I um, am up to date with the manga in Japan, which is currently at its 789th chapter. I just read the last chapter two days ago. And finally, you don't actually have to listen to me. The exits are located, um, this is the room with the most exits of the con, so feel free to leave if you feel the need to. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the man who made it all. His name is Ichiro Oda, as far as I know it's pronounced. Um, he was born in 1975. Uh, he started writing One Piece in 1996. Uh, Romance Dawn was the first chapter. It went through three iterations before becoming an official Shonen Jump manga in 1997. Um, and then it became an anime in uh, 1998. He was inspired by Vikings as a young child. He watched a cartoon about um, a friendly Viking and it sort of got the spark rolling. He was also a big fan of Akira Toyama, who was the creator of Dragon Ball, for those of you who do not know. Um, aside from that, he um, basically was the writer. He's the guy who makes the whole story. Wealth, fame, power. Gold Roger, the king of the pirates, attained this and everything else the world had to offer. His dying words drove countless souls to the sea. You want my treasure? You can have it. I left everything I gathered together in one place. Now you just have to find it. These words lured men to the Grand Line in search of dreams and treasures greater than they had ever been imagined, and this became known as the Great Pirate Era. So basically speaking, um, it's the story of Monkey D. Luffy. Um, for those of you who don't know what the D stands for, it's okay, neither do I. They're not at that point yet. Um, but it's obviously the search for the great treasure known as One Piece. It's um, thought to be at the end of the Grand Line, which I'll be getting to in a moment. And I will begin with a brief synopsis of the beginning of One Piece. Um, it's about a young boy named Luffy, that's uh, him pictured right there on the top. He was inspired by a pirate by the name of Red-Haired Shanks. Um, his crew frequently came to a bar on the island Luffy grew up on. And through um, just laughing and the cheering and the joy of piracy that comes with it, Luffy was you know, encouraged, constantly asked to join their crew, but um, Shanks would never take him. A group of mountain bandits show up, they wreck the bar a little bit, and they make fun of the pirates, but Shanks and his crew decide that it's not a fight worth having, so they don't go at, at it with the pirates. This upsets the young Luffy, and he decides to, you know, get angry. Shanks tells him not to, you know, it's not a big deal. Luffy gets mad and eats a fruit that is, um, that Shanks and his crew brought back. Uh, it turns out to be a bad choice for Luffy, as what he ate was known as the what he ate was known as the gum gum fruit. It is a devil fruit that turns your body into rubber. A little while later, Luffy decides to confront the bandits who made fun of Shanks, and the bandit leader kidnaps Luffy and takes him to just beat the crap out of him for you know upsetting them. Shanks shows up, um, shows that he and his crew are actually really powerful, that they just don't use their might unless they really feel the need to. So the bandit leader escapes, the rest of his crew being completely beaten, senseless, and he escapes to the ocean because, well, you'd never think to look for a mountain bandit in the middle of the sea. He takes Luffy with him, which he intended to use as a hostage, but he decides later to just toss Luffy into the water. Fortunately for Luffy, this actually saves him as throwing him overboard 
gave Luffy enough distance away from the local sea monster, which then decides to eat the mountain bandit. Uh, a little while later, the sea monster turns his sights onto Luffy, charges at him, but is saved at the last second by Shanks. However, this came at a great cost. Um, the monster did manage to bite off a piece of Shanks' arm. He saved Luffy's life, but it cost him his arm, and as a result, Luffy grew up very quickly that day. Uh, he no longer decided, he no longer wanted to ask Shanks to join his crew anymore. He was gonna just, you know, wait till he was older. Shanks laughs at him, and Luffy makes a vow that he'll make a crew better than Shanks, and then he'll become the king of the pirates. Shanks is impressed by this and decides to give Luffy his straw hat. And that's the reason why Luffy wears this hat is because Shanks gave it to him and told him, give it back to me when you become a great pirate. So, as far as the world of One Piece goes, there are four seas, um, five if you include the Grand Line. Uh, there is the North, South, East, and West Blue. The East Blue is considered the weakest of the seas, which is ironic considering that is the same sea that Gold Roger, the King of the Pirates, came from. And is where most of the, or is where the entirety of the first hundred chapters takes place, because Luffy is born there too. The Grand Line itself is um, where most of the story will take place. Uh, currently, we're still in the Grand Line. Uh, it runs across the world, um, basically on its equator, and it's thought that at the end of the Grand Line, that is where the treasure will be. So what you do is, um, to get into the Grand Line, see that uh, there's a continent called the Red Line, I'll get to that in a second, but you have to go to where the two of them intersect and there's a reversed waterfall that will pick you up and then throw you into the Grand Line. You can't enter the Grand Line through normal means because there is a two oceans aligned with the Grand Line called the Calm Belt. Uh, there's no waves, there's no currents, there's no wind, so it's impossible to sail through it. And even if you had a paddle boat or a, a rose, you wouldn't be able to because giant sea monsters live in there. Finally, the red line is the only continent in the world of One Piece. The rest of it is consistent of islands alone. Uh, it is perpendicular to the Grand Line and as its name states, it is a giant red mountain. So, going back to what I was saying about the fruit Luffy ate, um, fruit of the sea devil, otherwise known as devil fruits, are magical fruit that give the user specific abilities. Um, it can be anywhere between turning your body into smoke, giving you the ability to stretch, you can be diced up and still be okay. Um, it's impossible for two people to have the same power though. Once you eat a devil fruit, no one will have that same ability as you. Uh, they do take away your ability to swim. It's kind of the price of a devil fruit. To someone like Luffy, who was not able to swim as a young child because he just never learned how, this wasn't really that big of a drawback. But to someone who wants to swim all day, it's going to suck. It also makes you... Um, it's hard to tell what ability you're going to get from a devil fruit. Uh, they have found ways to decipher which devil fruits do what. Most devil fruits are still unknown until you take a bite. It also makes you weak to a substance known as sea prism stone. The easiest way to describe it is think kryptonite for devil fruit users. Touching it will basically take your ability away and prevent you from moving, as if you were submerged underwater. There are three types of devil fruits, and I apologize, I will have to cheat a little bit on my 100 chapter rule because one of the three types is not described in, within the first 100 chapters. The first type is the paramecia type. It has a specific effect on your body. Um, for example, Luffy's is the gum gum fruit, the rubber rubber fruit, which allows him to stretch like rubber. A paramecia type is the most general type. If it doesn't fit in the, two category, in the other two categories, you can bet that it's a paramecia. The second type of devil fruit is the zone type ability. It is, a, it is a devil fruit that allows you to turn yourself into an animal. You can retain your human form, or you can shift into a hybrid form. So if I ate a fruit that allowed me to turn into a cat, I could turn into a cat, turn into myself, or turn into a man with cat ears and cat paws. I'm sure you've seen plenty around the con. <laughs> 
And then finally, the rarest type of devil fruit is the Logia type. They give you elemental powers, which allow you to shift your body, you can launch yourself as your element, and you can dodge attacks by turning into the element. Uh, the example that I have here is a smoke-based devil fruit. It is the rarest type of the three devil fruits, and most consider it to be the most powerful type. However, no devil fruit is truly invincible because of substances like sea prism stone. There are two main factions throughout the world of One Piece. First of all, it is obviously pirates. Uh, you got your good ones, and then you got some not so nice ones. Then you have the marines, which is actually the same thing. There's good ones, and then there's bad ones. What I really like about One Piece is that neither side is 100% good or evil, so you have people that you're rooting for on both sides. There is also non-human races in One Piece. Uh, the only one that is covered in the first hundred chapters is the fishmen. They are ten times stronger than a normal human. This is doubled underwater. They are amphibious, meaning that they can walk on land and sea, and they are coming. They come in a wide variety. So there are stingray fishmen, there are octopi, there are smelt whitings, and the one that I will be focusing on is the sawtooth shark. This guy's name is Arlong. He is the leader of his own pirate crew known as the Arlong Pirates. Most pirate crews throughout One Piece are named after their captain for, you know, just for simplicity's sake. Uh, he has an extreme hatred of humans and was known for a time as the greatest evil in the East Blue. The reason for this is because for a time he had the highest bounty in the East Blue. The currency in One Piece is known as berries or bellies, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, think of it like a Japanese yen as the real world equivalent. They are considered as both a warning and an accomplishment, a warning to people and an accomplishment among pirates. The higher your bounty, the more impressive you are or the more terrifying you are, depending on who's asking. They are not, however, a measure of strength. For example, the 15 million bounty on the man in the corner there, I will be getting to these pirates, by the way. The man in the corner there has a devil fruit power, which is why he is of 15 million but the man up in the top, corner, the top right corner with 17 million on his head, the only reason he's considered more dangerous is because he leads his own armada. However, Luffy does eventually defeat each of these bad guys, and as a result, he is given a bounty higher than any of them, which is 30 million as his starting bounty. Uh, the basic plot for every arc, which is a section of the story, Luffy will arrive at a new location with his crew. They will meet a new friend or comrade or somebody who is in need of trouble. A local evil will show up and cause an amount of chaos or problems here and there. Then Luffy and crew will defeat said evil. They will move on to their next location. It's pretty much lather, rinse, repeat for the first few arcs. However, it does change up now and then. The final arc of the first hundred chapters, there actually isn't an evil going on. It's more of a storm is coming, and it's a race against time instead. If Luffy doesn't get off the island before the storm hits, they won't be able to sail, and the Marines will capture them. The Straw Hat Pirates. The Straw Hat Pirates. They are the main protagonists of the story. They are kind, and they're courageous, and they are always generous and highly focused, and they are led by the most terrifying force of nature you will ever meet. <laughs> because this series also does have an amount of comedy. So they are led by the terrifying monkey D. Luffy. His goal is to be the king of the pirates, and as a result, he is the captain of his own pirate crew. He is typically and primarily a melee fighter, using his rubber abilities to enhance his attacks by stretching backwards and then punching forward. As you can see by defeating the very same sea monster that bit Shank's arm off when he was a kid, he grew much stronger as he got older. Because of his devil fruit, the gum gum fruit, Luffy is unable to swim. However, he's able to customize his fighting style to match the opponent properly. Uh, one time he was fighting a fish man, so he took his fingers and formed them into a net, figuring that fish would, you know, be weak to nets. But, uh, 
In Japan, Luffy's devil fruit is known as the gomu gomu no mi, which is the rubber rubber fruit. The reason it's translated to gum gum fruit is, I think it's for simplicity's sake. A lot of people say it's because four kids got to it first and they didn't want to say rubber. I'm not really sure what the reason is, but personally, I like gum gum better than rubber rubber, so I'm rolling with it. He is not the brightest person outside of combat. He is a tactical genius, able to customize a different fighting style depending on his opponent, but usually he's a shoot first, ask questions later kind of guy, just does whatever he feels. But he has a heart of gold. He will never turn down somebody who is in trouble. He'll never not do what's right um, unless it's stealing food, in which case he's okay with it. The second member of Luffy's crew is Roro no Azoro, known as the Pirate Hunter. Uh, originally, he was not a member of Luffy's crew until Luffy managed to convince him otherwise. He is debated to be the first mate of the crew because many people believe he is the second strongest member. I am one of those people. Uh, he practices Santoryu, which is three sword style. He actually holds two swords in each hand and then a sword in his mouth. Uh, because of this, he is extremely confident. There was one time he was purchasing swords and he found a cursed sword among them. The shop owner told him to not buy the sword because it's cursed, so he threw it in the air, held his arm out, and said, if it chops my arm off, I don't get to keep it. As the sword fell, it just grazed his wrist, the back of it. As a result, the shopkeeper was so impressed that he gave him the sword and the family heirloom sword of the shop for free. Uh, he lost his rival at a young age when he was a child. This young girl named Kuina was his rival at their dojo that they trained together in. He could not defeat her at all, but they both had the same dream to be the world's greatest swordsman. However, there was an accident and she died. As a result, Zoro asked if he could keep her sword, which is one of the 21 Wazamono swords. There are three, four, four types of swords. There is the regular type, which is the kind you and I would buy. There is the great grade swords, which two of Zoro's swords are. There is, I'm sorry, there is the better grade swords, which are the kind that Zoro, the two Zoro wields. Then there is the great grade, which is the one that he got from Kuina when she died. And then there is the supreme grade sword, which are very rare. I believe there's only 10, or is there 15? I would have to double check my numbers on that. He is searching to defeat the world's greatest swordsman, and actually within the first hundred chapters, he does succeed in finding said swordsman. However, he lost very painfully. After such a thing, he promised to Luffy that he would never lose again. He drinks like a fish and sleeps like a bear. He is the only member of the crew to successfully stay asleep while sitting on deck in the middle of a hurricane, so you can call that impressive in itself. The third member of Luffy's crew is Nami. She is their navigator and cartographer. Um, she's very skilled with um, weather. She, uh, you know how you're, you know how when your grandmother says my ankle hurts, it's gonna rain tomorrow and then it rains? She's the kind of person who will look at a clear sky and say it's gonna rain in five minutes and then it rains in five minutes. So, it's an impressive ability. She has a love of money and tangerines. This comes from growing up, her adoptive mother owned a tangerine orchard, and the reason she loves money is because she's been spending most of her life collecting it, and she grew up very poor. She is a scam artist and a thief, primarily targeting pirates because she hates them with a burning passion. The reason for that is because the aforementioned Arlong came to her island, killed her mother, and forced her to join his crew because of her cartography skills. She had to collect 100 million berries to buy back her hometown or Arlong would destroy it. And as a result, she hated pirates up until Luffy decided it's time to make Nami a member of my crew. I'm gonna beat up this Arlong guy and then she'll have to join me. Uh, her dream is to draw the map of the world. The fourth member of Luffy's crew is a man named Usopp. He is the sniper of their crew. He has particularly amazing aim. He has a avid liar with a long nose. It is a Pinocchio reference. And he actually was the captain of his own pirate crew for a time. Uh, it consisted of three small children, so it really wasn't much of a crew, but 
His father is actually a pirate as well, a member of Shanks' crew. As a result, Luffy and Usopp had something to bond off of at the very first second. The two of them got along very quickly, and usually if you see one doing something stupid, the other one isn't too far behind. Much like every other member of Luffy's crew, everyone has a tragic backstory, something that they have lost or something that has happened to them. For Usopp, it was, for Usopp, it was his mother. She, uh, he lost her to a sickness, and every morning while she was sick, he would run through the town screaming, the pirates are coming, in hopes that it would raise up her morale, thinking that his father had come you know, back with a cure or something of such. Even after she died, Usopp continued to run through the village screaming, pirates are coming every morning. Uh, most people of the island took it as a wake-up call after a while. But uh, his dream is to become a brave warrior of the sea, just like his father. The fifth and final member of the crew that we meet is a man named Sanji. He is the cook of the crew, able to keep the food, you know, going. And he never fights with his hands because of this, believing that a chef's greatest tools are his hands, and if something were to happen to them, then he wouldn't be able to cook anymore. Because of this, he has mastered his footwork when it comes to fighting. Uh, remember how I was saying that fishmen are ten times stronger than a human? That is a fish man, and the guy next to him is Sanji, barefoot. He has an avid love of ladies. It's actually one of the primary reasons why he originally joined Luffy's crew was because Nami was a member of it. And when he was a young child, he lost everything in a pirate raid. He was an apprentice on a uh, cooking vessel, and this band of pirates showed up. The captain was the leader of a cooking pirate crew, actually, known as Redfoot Zeph. That same pirate, Redfoot Zeph, jumped into the sea after Sanji fell overboard and saved his life. However, both ships were destroyed in the storm that happened during the pirate raid, and because of this, the two of them were stranded on a rock. Redfoot Zeph gave up his leg so that Sanji could continue to live. See, when they were stuck on the rock, they had a limited supply of food. So Zeph tricked Sanji into thinking that Zeph had more food than him. So they separated to both sides of the island. Zeph's bag of food was actually a bag of gold. So Zeph ate his leg to survive. Uh, in the anime, it's uh, a chain took his leg off because cannibalism is frowned upon in television. As a result of this childhood trauma, Sanji will not turn down a hungry person, no matter how terrible they are, no matter how good they are. And his dream is to find a location known as the All Blue. Remember how I was saying that there are four different seas, the East, North, South, and West Blues? Um, there are different fish in each of those areas, but there is thought to be a location on the Grand Line where all those fish gather together. The recruitment process of the Straw Hat Pirates is very simple. Luffy will come up to you and tell you that he wants you to join your crew. Most people will say no because being a pirate is not something you wake up and decide you want to do, unless you're Luffy. Luffy then helps them solve a particular problem that's going on. Uh, for the example of Zoro, he was about to be executed. Nami was a member of, uh, of Arlong's crew. Usopp just wanted to go out to sea. So Luffy helped these people, and then they joined the crew of the free will, of course. Yes? He did, and I, I will be getting to that, but yes, that is true. So finally, I will be going over each opponent that Luffy faces in the first hundred chapters while trying to explain the arc that they appear in. The first opponent that Luffy fights against is Alvida. Some debate that the bandit crew leader was actually his real first opponent. I consider this to be Luffy's first opponent as an official pirate. Uh, from her reign of terror, Luffy saved a young boy named Kobe. This young boy wanted to grow up and be a marine, but he accidentally wound up on one of Alvida's boats, and they forced him to join their crew as a cabin boy, basically a slave, pretty much. After um, Luffy defeats her, Kobe gets to travel with Luffy for a little bit. She's known as Iron Mace Alvida, strictly because of the giant Iron Mace she carries, and considers herself to be the most beautiful woman in the world. 
actually, she actually does later on get that wish. She finds and consumes the Suba Suba no Mi, otherwise known as the smooth smooth fruit, and it gains the ability to become perfectly smooth. Bullets, rocks, things like that will fly right off. They'll just slip right past her. This does include fat for some reason. Because of this, she is now actually living up to the title that she loves. It does not make her invincible. Bullets can still hurt her. It's just harder for things to hit her. The next opponent Luffy faces is the dreaded Captain Morgan, not to be confused with the rum. He is a marine captain, a very corrupt one at that, and he replaced his hand with a giant axe. Because what's more crazy than a giant axe? <laughs> I'm keeping that idea. <laughs> Luffy's first encounter with the marines is this guy, so obviously it shows the audience that the marines aren't the nicest people in the world either. He has a bratty little son named Helmeppo, and Helmeppo is basically this little wimp who uses his father's name to get what he wants. If you don't do what I say, I'll tell my daddy, he'll come and kill you. Because of this, he was able to travel through town freely with his pet wolf. The wolf would just eat whatever it wanted. This little girl tried to stop the wolf, and the wolf was going to go bite the little girl. Zoro, who just happened to be in the town, killed the wolf, but Helmeppo made a deal with Zoro. If you sit out 30 days of punishment for making me upset. My dad won't go on a rampage and kill everyone here because you killed my pet wolf. Zoro agrees to this. However, Helmeppo decides that I'm just gonna kill him on day 29 instead of you know letting him go on day 30. Luffy gets mad, goes, punches Helmeppo, then goes to Zoro and says, hey, they're gonna execute you a day early. If I go get your swords, will you join my pirate crew? Zoro says no and Luffy goes, well, what if I help you and then you don't die? And Zoro, you know, they basically have like this little debate and then eventually Luffy does go get his swords. Zoro gets his swords back, helps Luffy defeat Morgan and joins his crew because now he's attacked the Marines, now he's gonna be considered a pirate. The next opponent Luffy goes up with is his first encounter with the devil fruit user, Buggy the Clown. And before you ask, yes, the nose is real. <laughs> and because of this nose, Buggy, um, basically decided to go with the clown epitaph because nobody else is going to see him as anything else. He is the consumer of the chop chop fruit, the bara bara no mi in Japan, and it makes him immune to being sliced and diced. Also because of this, any part that's been sliced previously, he can now cut off himself and float around. The only part of him that can't float is his feet. He must stay within a certain radius of his feet, and if somebody were to hold his feet, he would be able to fly with that person on his back. I've never seen Buggy carry his own feet in order to fly, so I don't know if that's possible yet. It would be really cool, but... Uh, fun fact is this devil fruit is also Oda's favorite. Um, when asked which devil fruit would he eat, he said that the Bara Bara Fruit No Mi is his favorite, and that would be the one that he would consume. He has a personal problem with Shanks. Upon seeing Luffy's straw hat, he gets angry and explains this. When he was a young child, he and Shanks were cabin boys on the same pirate crew. The pirate crew attained the Bara Bara no Mi, and they were going to, you know, just keep it as a trophy, or one of the crewmates was going to eat it. But Buggy overheard how much devil fruits are worth on black markets. He was going to sell it and, you know, live out his life in glorious riches. However, while trying to hide the devil fruit in his mouth, for some reason, Shanks accidentally snuck up on him to try and tell him something. Buggy got shocked and ate the devil fruit. As a result, Buggy hates Shanks now, and seeing Luffy's straw hat really ticked him off. As a result, he now hates Luffy too. The next opponent, as mentioned earlier, is Captain Kuro. He is the leader of the Black Cat Pirates, and the rest of his crew does share this theme with him. He is a tactical genius, as he was known as back when he was a pirate. Every member of his crew, as I said, does have a cat theme to them, except for Jongo. He is a hypnotist. I'm not really sure why he didn't have to fit the cat theme, but as a hypnotist, Jongo can use his hypnosis to strengthen crew members by making them think they're not injured or making them think they're stronger than they really are. 
However, this does backfire because of Luffy's gullibility. His devil, um, when hypnotized, Luffy was also staring at it. So when he said, crew, you are now 10 times stronger, Luffy became 10 times stronger. <laughs> he had a three year long plan, if I remember correctly, to fake his own death, which because faking his own death, it happened to be the very same crew that Captain Morgan was a member of. He killed this entire crew except one, Captain Morgan, and said, good, I'm gonna use you. Jango hypnotizes him into thinking he killed Captain Kuro, and that's how he got the promotion that made him a Marine captain. Uh, this three year long plan was to pretend to be a butler to this young girl right here. Her name is Miss Kaya. You may have saw her in the picture during Usopp's page. Uh, she was a wealthy young girl with wealthy parents in this rich, extravagant mansion on the same island Usopp grew up on. She has a semi-romantic relationship with Usopp and can't wait for the day he comes back from being a pirate. But his three-year-long plan was to eventually, after gaining the island's trust, kill her and her parents, make it look like an accident, and then take everything that they have in their will because he'd be the last member left of the family. Eventually, Luffy does defeat him, and Usopp joins his crew. The next opponent is Don Krieg. He is the unstoppable military might of the East Blue. Uh, he is the captain of his own armada, and he is a cheater. That's how, the easiest way to put it. He has a giant, unbreakable armor with tons of weapons hidden underneath it. He has an exploding spear. He'll pretend to surrender to trick people into getting close and then shoot them in the face and he's not afraid to poison his own crew if it means he gets to win. He actually did go to the Grand Line in hopes of conquering it, but was hastily defeated by a man named Dracul Mihawk, who I will get to right after this. He attempted to take control of the Baratier, which was the fishing restaurant that uh, Luffy, not Luffy, Sanji and Redfoot Zeff opened up after surviving their almost starvation. Dracul Mihawk is the world's greatest swordsman. He is also able to cut ships in half, which he does um, very early on in the series. You can see that this giant ship that Don Krieg owns, he slices it in half. The reason he attacked Don Krieg was strictly because they just got in his way as he was traveling. He wields a sword known as Yoru, which is one of the supreme grade swords. It is one of the, you know, ten in existence that I was mentioning. But when Zoro finally meets him, Zoro says, you know, I want to challenge you for the title of greatest swordsman. So he pulls out that butter knife and uses that to defeat Zoro. That's how good he is. He is a member of the Shibukai, otherwise known as the Seven Warlords of the Sea. These are seven pirates that the government has said, you can go do whatever you want as long as we get a cut and you don't attack our buildings. Because of this, he has incredible power and no bounty. One of the reasons is he is so powerful is during his younger days, he was a childhood rival of Shanks, and many people debated whether or not he and Shanks were the greatest swordsmen in the world. So that's that's how strong Shanks is. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the greatest. However, after Shanks lost his arm, he sort of just gave the title to Mihawk because obviously one sword puts him at a disadvantage. However, the two of them still share a friendly relationship as after Luffy gets his bounty, Mihawk goes out of his way to find Shanks and say, hey, that kid you were telling me about's got a bounty now. This makes Shanks really happy. He gets drunk and it's hilarity. The next opponent that Luffy goes up against is Arlong, who I have mentioned a couple times. He had the highest bounty in the East Blue until defeated by Luffy, and he forced Nami into working in his crew. He bribed the Navy to keep them off his back, this annoying little mousy guy. I had a picture of him earlier when I was showing the Marines. He's not really uh, worth mentioning. His name is Nizumi, for those of you who do want to know. but. He almost took over the entire East Blue had Luffy not been there to stop him because the government was more concerned with the Grand Line, which is more dangerous, the other three seas, which are more powerful, and finally he was bribing Nizumi to say, no, nothing's wrong in the East Blue, everything's cool. 
So, fortunately, he had Nami in his crew, and Luffy wanted Nami. So Luffy said, hey, you're hurting all these people. You made my navigator cry, and when I say my navigator, I have to get rid of you because she's your navigator right now. <laughs> the final opponent Luffy goes up against is Marine Captain Smoker. He is a Marine Captain, as I just said. But he ate the smoke smoke fruit, otherwise known as the Moku Moku no Mi. It's a Logia type, which allowed him to basically dodge any attack that came at him. His second in command is Tashigi. If she looks familiar, that's good, because she does. She looks a lot like Helena, which was Zoro's childhood friend. As a result, Zoro and her do not get along. Zoro because he can't really fight someone who looks like somebody he cared about, and her because Zoro has one of the legendary swords. The reason why she hates Zoro for that reason is her, her dream, her goal, is to take all the, you know, good grade swords, great grade, and supreme out of the hands of pirates. I have no idea how she's going to get Mihawks, but it's a goal. Uh, actually, Smoker does almost capture Luffy, like near the very end of the hundred chapters. However, he is saved by a mysterious man named Dragon. This is the only time you see this man named Dragon. He shows up, stops Smoker, and then this giant gust of wind basically swoops in and like separates Luffy from Smoker. So. Nobody's really sure why, at this point, Dragon did that, and nobody at this point knows who Dragon really is. So, after that, Luffy and his crew gather together. They promise to find their dreams at the end of the Grand Line, and by finding the One Piece, they will become the greatest pirate crew in the world who have the King of the Pirates at their back. Um, with that, this is the end of the first hundred chapters. I'm willing to take questions if anybody has them. Yes? Where is Chopper fit in this? Uh, Chopper actually is a member of the crew who joins after the Grand One, after, they, after the first hundred chapters. Yes? Can you explain how this Grand Line works in the geography? I didn't catch that with the reverse waterfalls and all that. So at the Red Line, which is the, where, the inter, where it intersects with the uh, Grand Line. I wish I had had a better picture. But um, there's four reverse waterfalls. The location is known as Reverse Mountain, if I remember correctly. But thank you. Um, but you, from one of those four waterfalls, you go up it to like the very peak, and then there's only one waterfall that goes down and into the Grand Line. And then from there, you just sail around the world to try and get to the other side. Yes? Oh, there was one thing I never understood about the, like that picture. If the Grand Line goes all the way around, does the Red Line go all the way around as well? Yes. Wouldn't there be a second point where they meet? There is a second point where, they're meet, where they meet, but there is not a second set of waterfalls, okay. which is why there is only one way in. Anyone else? Yes? Uh, yes, there is a specific way that the currents flow in the Grand Line. Uh, if it would, I'm hoping that next year I can do another panel talking more about the subject. Yes. Yes. That is actually because the weather patterns in the Grand Line are incredibly dangerous. There are people powerful enough, but so far the King of the Pirates is the only person who has made it to the very last island on the Grand Line. So I'm guessing the waters there are even more dangerous. Uh, the Grand Line is known as the Pirate's Graveyard. So that is basically where people go to die. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you all for coming and listening to me talk. If you liked this panel, um, they're doing something on the app. I'm not really sure because I don't have the app, but they have a classic on app talking about the panels. Thank you for coming.